I was one of a couple of um, kids of color in the school and I had to hear that N-word uh, at a Catholic school, mind you, daily. And, you know, it, 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 it stays with you. you know, it doesn't leave. And so, um, and then going to high school and to college, and I thought that with education and doing the right things, and part of that's still in my brain, and I've, I've, I've acknowledged that it's not right, and I'll get to that, is that if you did the right things as society said you should, you won't fall under one of these labels. We're really thrilled to have the Harriet Tubman Gallery, which um, allows artists to feature their artwork uh, here at the Harriet Tubman House. And we're really thrilled to have Kevin here to exhibit his photography, especially around the topic of stereotypes. Our gallery has served as an opportunity for us to really leverage art as a way to have important dialogue and discussions um, that we need to have as a society. USES has been instrumental over our century-long history of um, really working towards social justice and improving the lives of others. Um, so we're really thrilled. Um, Evan, thank you. I want to thank the board of directors here at the Harriet Tubman and allowing me to uh, put this exhibit on. I want to thank you all for uh, coming down and spending some of your time here to take in the exhibit. Hopefully you enjoyed it. Um, I do have one request after you viewed it, if you can fill out the anonymous questionnaire, that would be greatly appreciated. Uh, I hope to kind of catalog all the information that comes out of this and, and put it into a book. So uh, sometime in the uh, near future. I, I guess I'll give you a little bit of the journey about how this came about. Um, feel free to interject with questions at any time, so don't feel like you can't interrupt. Uh, about three years ago, uh, I had an incident at work, and this is how I dress every day in the uh, financial district, where I got stopped by security because uh, at the end of the day, I guess apparently, even though I was in a suit and a backpack like every other person there, I didn't, I, I looked out of place despite leaving the building. Um, so I was pretty bothered by it, and then a couple weeks, a couple weeks later, I had another incident where I was on the floor, laptop in hand, suit and tie, etc., and... I got questioned as to why I was on the floor, um, which kind of boggled my mind. Granted, the floors are secure and you only have access to the floor that you work on, and I was on a floor that I didn't work on, which is what a lot of people do. They're always going to different meetings, as some of you in here know. And I got questioned as to why I was there, if I needed help, I looked lost, et cetera, et cetera. And so, you know, out of a little bit of frustration and anger, and but just mainly disappointment, I. Um, wrote some things down and I, I went over to New England School of Photography where I'd been taking classes under my mentor, Nick Johnson. And I went downstairs and the studio set up some lights and I put a projector next to a laptop, connected it up, put the words up on the black backdrop and asked Nick to come down to just check my lighting and he had no idea what I was doing and he comes down and he sees all these words, he sees the N word across the, the middle of the screen and he said, you know, well, what are you doing with this? And I think he was trying to figure out like, I see a bunch of words, the lighting's fine, but I don't, I don't know what your objective is. And I said, I walked in front of the screen, in front of the backdrop, and I, he saw the N word and all the words across, and he took a step back and he said, wow, um, you know, what spurred this? And I told him the story and, and then developed the film. This is all film photography, by the way, not Photoshop. And then he said, you know, I think you should go forward with this. I think you should do more. And I said, well, I plan to, I just don't know what direction I want to go into. Um, so I started to take a look around what's going on in the news, I think as you all know. And this was, this was three years ago when I did my photograph. And so I did a lot of writing about this and I started looking at all the groups that are kind of stigmatized in our society and globally. And it just so happened once I started really getting into the development of the project about a year and a half later, uh, a year and a half ago, that all the stuff started going on in the news even more so. So I think if you look in the news today, there's, there's the, uh, the gay rights movement, which has really had a lot of progression this year, fortunately. Um, and then there's all the talk about Muslims. So uh, I think it's pretty relevant where we are with this today, with this project, and I'm glad it's out there, and I'm glad you all can see it. And I hope it gets out there a little bit further. But as I, let me backtrack a bit. As I went around and tried to find people to photograph, like a director for a movie, I wanted to find people that fit the part. 
not so much because, for instance, a gay man, just because he's gay, I wanted someone that doesn't look gay as opposed to the typical stereotype or doesn't look like a lesbian or doesn't look like this or doesn't look like that. I wanted someone who, who, um, who has a strong contribution to society because that's what I felt was important. I also wanted people to see that these are people that you see every day on the street and that you go to at some form or fashion when you need a service done, done for you, whether it be a doctor, photographer, teacher, et cetera. These are all people that play a part in society. And that was important to me. So as I went through, I started narrowing the gaps and, and, and calling it down and getting the groups that I felt are the most stigmatized in our society and globally, and that's how I came up with the, the five members for sexual uh, excuse me, orientation. Uh, the two groups I think you hear about it every day in the news, which is Jewish and Muslims for faith. And then for race, the four groups that I think have been really, have really struggled, in particular Native Americans. And then from a gender perspective, I don't think I need to include men because we're the problems, we're the reason that a lot of the women have the problems that they have in this, in our, in this world, particularly in our society. Um, so that's, that's where I came about. I did a lot of research on the words that you saw, uh, that you've seen plastered across the bodies. Unfortunately, and I will admit, I've used some of those words in my time. Um, I've read about some of these words, I've heard these words, and I've read these words. So I think you know, there's a lot of words that you may or may not be familiar with, but these words are generational, and they're also geographical. So words that are familiar to you here in New England may not be familiar to others across the country or in other parts of the world. But if you were to go to Chicago, there are words for Hispanics that are used. If you go to the South, there are words that are used for me or people that look like me that aren't used here in the North or other parts of the country. And the same for, for, uh, for the other groups as well. So out of all the subjects in there, not everybody knew the words or had heard the words, but I did ask them if there were words that I was missing in the uh, exhibit that I should add. And one interesting point is the Jewish man who's my friend's father, He's 73 years old. And so his family came over from the war uh, when they were kicked out of, the, not kicked out of, but they escaped from Germany. And he had, I didn't have the word horns. And he, so he, as we're setting up and I have every subject review the words on the, uh, on, the, on the backdrop and I said, I'm not sure what you mean by horns. He said, well, when I was an undergrad, uh, I went to school up in Vermont and a gentleman came up to me who was in my class and said, where are your horns? And he said, I, I'm not, you know, I'm not in the Elks Club, I don't know what you mean. He says, no, no, you're Jewish. And he says, yeah, I know I'm Jewish. He said, but I understand that Jews have horns. He said, well, I, I, we don't have horns. That's, that's, that's false, that's a myth, that's a misnomer. And he says, no, no, I wanna, and he kept looking and tussling with his hair trying to find horns. So we had to move his hair around to show the man that he doesn't have horns. So I, uh, I said, do you mind if I add the word horns to the exhibit? And he said, no, please. So if you notice on the photograph, I know a few people have mentioned it to me tonight in the past that I added the word horns, but I put it in a place where horns would be. So that's just an instance of where there were words that I didn't have and wasn't familiar with, but he knew. And when I've talked to other folks of Jewish faith, they told me a similar story about horns. So when you look at some of the words, although you may not recognize them, may not have heard them, and hopefully haven't used them, and if you've used them, hopefully you're not using them going forward, um, just know that there's a story behind a lot of them. And there's also words that you may use in your everyday diction that you may not realize are derogatory. It's just the way it is. And unfortunately, a lot of these words still sting and um, have negative t labels attached to them. So um, I, right now the exhibit is complete with 15. I would like to add an additional photograph for gender, uh, excuse me, for faith to round it out, to have a, a Jewish female. And I may add another photograph for gender, but overall I think I've represented a lot of the groups as a whole that, are, uh, that deal with a lot of BS on a daily basis uh, in this society and around the world. And unfortunately, I think, um, as it stands today, the Muslim community is really starting to take it hard. Um, and hopefully that doesn't turn for the worse. Uh, I'm happy to see that the, the gay, gay rights movement, which is very parallel to the civil rights movement in the 60s, has had progress. And uh, I want to say it's not, it hasn't taken them as long, but I think they're still trying to get there just like we are as well. So. Uh, again, thank you for coming. Um, any questions or that anybody has regarding the exhibit or myself or
related to the project, um, I'm all ears. Right, so that, that's Nick Johnson, my mentor. So when we, when we sat down and uh, Nick gave me a lot of guidance on this, we, we did a photograph um, of a friend who's white male, Bob. And um, you know, it was funny because it, you gotta find the right person to ask who uh, is comfortable with having these words plastered, particularly because as a white male, they're viewed as the, um, the driver of a lot of this. And so, he was adamant that he, he said, please make sure that people don't think that I'm this, this horrible person. And I said, you're not Trump. So we, we took, I'm sorry, we took the, uh, I'll leave politics out. We took the photograph um, and I had him do a variety of different expressions. And as you notice in the photograph, everybody has the same expression. I wanted them to look through the camera and kind of defeat the words that are being cast upon them. And with Bob, with the white man, we did it with a smirk, a smile, arms folded, kind of an arrogant pose, and it, it just didn't work. It, 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 yeah, there was no slurs that stuck, and it just, and I, we also felt that it took away from the objective of what this was about, and which was trying to wait, raise awareness and show people the right, or the wrongs, and the, and the right way about going about getting to know people and how you should treat people. And, and I think if you look around in each of the photographs, in each of the four categories, I mean, I honestly can say I know somebody in each of the groups, right? And of the 15, myself is in, the, in one of them. I know somebody in each of those 14 photographs. And I think if you thought about your life and your world is how you, and you carry yourself each day, you probably know somebody in, at least in two of those categories. And if they're your loved ones, friends, acquaintances, et cetera, you look at that person as who they are. You don't judge them for how they're perceived because they fall under this stereotype or this, excuse me, this category. And so I'm hoping as we, we go through you know, life and through um, our daily lives that you, you, you kind of just open your mind up and judge a person by who they are as a person, not because they fall under being black or Native American or because they're a woman or they're a gay man or a gay female, et cetera. Judge the person because of how they treat you and how you treat them, not because they fall under a category. A little bit long-winded, but. Can I, can I, can I, before you ask, I want to introduce Stephen to my right. Stephen is the man in the transgender photograph. He was on the cover of the Art New England magazine. Um, and he's here as, uh, to uh, say hello to everybody. Thanks Stephen for coming. Um, I was wondering if there are other um, groups that you have thought about profiling in your work or speaking with, um, like for instance, people with disabilities or, yeah. I had considered uh, people with disabilities. Um, I'm still torn about including them. Also, um, teen mothers, because of, uh, I know a few teen mothers in my day, and, and I've talked to, uh, I spoke with an advocate um, who had agreed to uh, be photographed and then eventually backed out. Um, so I, I kind of go back and forth about adding those two because I think those two are important, um, particularly teen moms. Uh, but I'm, right now I'm kind of up in the air as to, as to including it, but it's a good suggestion. Thank you. How does the media affect, uh, how does the media have effect on these words? <laughs> Depends on what media outlet you're watching, I guess, right? Uh, yeah. Um, I, I don't, I think What's going on today, I, I, I think it depends on the topic. I mean, from, you know, at least from folks of the Muslim faith perspective, depending on the channel you're watching, it, it, I think they kind of can add some negativity by, by the way things are, re how things are reported. Um, I don't think they always add a positive light. You know, in some cases they do, in some cases they don't, but I, I, I just think it's important that us as individuals need to um, educate ourselves on the different groups, particularly on the faiths, and, and really get an understanding before you go ahead and group or categorize people as, and particularly in, in relation to Muslims, as radicals. Because you're talking about the largest faith in the world, or what is considered the largest faith as a whole, um, 
and you're talking about 0.01% or maybe even less than that that are considered radical, but they're all being lumped in negatively, and, and I think the way some of the media is portraying it isn't very favorable to a lot of people. In my, in my opinion, these are my opinions. Um, so this summer, my husband facilitated a workshop around stereotypes for our young men at Camp Hale, which is our sleepaway camp in New Hampshire, and he's in the back, um, back there. So um, one of the things that drew me to this exhibit was his workshop that we had an opportunity to participate in. And what it was simply was an opportunity for um, all of us to write different words that come to mind for the different, you know, racial, ethnic, religious, gender, and the like um, groups. And just to pick up on the point of the media, I think it's important, one of the things that he really brought to light for us was, you know, who created these words? And we all pointed to the media. I think we always look at, it's the media, we hear this in the media. And the point he brought home that sticks with me today is that we actually are the ones who came up with those labels. That it was, yeah. it was our words, we put them on there. We weren't told to put negative stereotypes, positive, whatever it was, it's whatever came to mind. And it pushed, I think, um, the, the, the young folks in the room, and Jarrell is here as well as our camp director can speak to this, to really think about owning mm -hmm. our stereotypes of one another and what that means in terms of our action. And so I would like to ask the audience to think about this and to, to think about how these words can be turned into action, and we've seen that, right, and how it's played out. But to, to think about it in the sense of, you know, we own these words. We're the ones who use them. You, you know, you found them and put them there, but these are words that we have created and, and put there. So more of a comment than a question. Hi, so um, I had already addressed this with you, but I felt that it was important, a point, an important point to perhaps share with the rest of the audience. My question had been more about the, sh the structuring of your exhibit in different categories when many of us belong to more than one. And how do you, um, perhaps, what was your experience with working with people who might have actually been in multiple categories, but yet only represent one aspect of their identity. And oftentimes when you are walking on a street, you never know what somebody might read you as and what they're going to target. Mm. So I could be walking on a street as a black woman or a, or a bisexual black woman, but somebody might identify me and be like, well, oh gosh, you are, you know, I get out the street, bitch, or, you know, whatever. So just wanted to discuss a little bit more about the idea of our identities being intersectional. I know you have, go on, uh, I would think you'd have something on this, no? Oh, well, well, we had actually talked about trying to get a black trans woman and, you know, discuss the intersectionalities and the multiple layers of oppression. Uh, we haven't acted on any of that, but that is certainly where the topics are going with this intersectionality. I think it's a great point that you make. I have no real answer for that, but um, it's, a, it's a certainly a point to, to look at and to you know, bring that into the discussion, and hopefully maybe Kevin can expand on that at some point uh, with his time. No, yeah, exactly. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> Um, yeah, Stephen and I, and I have talked about it. Um, in speaking with a lot of the subjects that I photographed, that didn't come up um, with most, with the exception of the conversation that Stephen and I had. But with others, I think they were just happy that something was being done. Um, but I think that's, I, I wish I had thought of that or I wish it had come up during the whole project or with, with more than just one person. So I think that's an interesting um, point that you made, um, and there's probably a lot more to that. Thank you, Stephen. So you have your um, survey here. I just wondered if you could talk about any of your outcomes from what you got back from this. <laughs> hey, Karen. Yes. So. Um, when we did the, uh, when I had the first opening at Gallery 7, hey guys, um, 
probably had about 170 some odd responses back over a five week period. And I've started cataloging all of the uh, responses from the questionnaires and some pretty in interesting um, information. Uh, of the four groups, race, faith, uh, gender, and orientation, uh, what was surprising is that faith was the number one group for bias. Um, race was two, gender was, actually uh, race was two, um, orientation was three, and gender was four. Um, on the night of the opening of the reception, gender was by far leading the pack. And what was interesting was gender, the bias from gender came from other women, not from men, which was startling. Um, but over time, in the next several weeks, as the exhibit played out, um, the feedback has been, as I, I just went through it the other day, it's still, it's, 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 uh, it's changed. Um, not surprised by that, but I think what I am surprised is that gender was, the issue with bias with gender was other women. And I talked to a friend of mine who came in uh, for the event from Seattle, and she had said, I met with her for coffee the next day, and she said, you know what, what category I rated my highest bias? And I said, no. And she goes, you know me, you know me well. And I, and I, and I just was, I said, it can't be gender. And she said, yeah, it's gender. She goes, I have issues working with strong women. And Mind you, she's one of the strongest women I know. But she said um, her and her husband take issues with, with the same, with her gender. And so with, when it came to, and with the category of race, with number two, black males led uh, race uh, overall, which unfortunately did not surprise me, but it was young black males. And I think we all have seen all the stories in the news about, um, the unfortunate deaths of young black males across this country. And I think there was one, and Nick, you may remember this, when we, when we read the card, the woman had noted that she got very fearful around tough looking young black males. And, uh, you know, it, it kind of, you know, for me it was like a punch in the stomach because it wasn't too long ago that I was a young black male and, uh, um, and it made me think about how I was treated um, when I got on elevators and when doors would lock and um, people cross the street and some of that shit still happens, excuse me. But um, I just think the responses have been interesting and, and what I like is that people have been very forthright and very honest and I think that's, that's good and I think it's good for the person that, that notes that too because they're being honest with themselves and that's why it's anonymous. Uh, and I think that helps the person be a little bit more forthright. Um, <clears throat> I'm thinking about, like, well, first of all, I'm the camp director that my Shari was talking about. And we did something like this similar at our camp. And I can't stop thinking about how there should be a white male up there. Being a black male and understanding stereotypes as a black male, I have tons of stereotypes for white males. Tons and tons. If you put, I, I could help you if you need, <laughs> if you need me to present some for you because I think that's a big part of it. Well, it, yeah, and sorry to interrupt. It, um, we, we had labels, but we felt that, and we talked to several people, we had labels, but they don't stick the same way the words stick to the other groups, because... Me, as, sorry to interrupt you. No, sir. But maybe if you put that white man in a police officer uniform, you would get other labels. Like, I think there's a way to expand it so that... Because if you have a black man up there with a serious face versus a black man with a smile, or even an obese white man, like, you get all types of different ways that people stretch their stereotypes. Mm -hmm. And I think looking at the, the one... The, up the staircase is three women mm -hmm. with the same words. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you just let people go off on the three different women, not I, that, there could be different words for each individual woman I agree. and each I agree. individual yes. facial expression. Yep. Yep. So in thinking about and talking to my young men at camp, young men and women at camp, uh -huh. we talked a lot about the first thing that comes to mind is black, white, I mean black, Hispanic, mm -hmm. Muslim, all of this. And then it's like, well, what about, what about white people? Because then, you, so we're trying not to segregate and then we start to segregate 
white people all of a sudden, and you don't even realize you're doing it. And that was, in, in thinking about this project, I think it's amazing, but as I try to bring all people together of all backgrounds and get them to understand that, mm -hmm. let's just, you can identify it and identify your culture and understand it and respect it, mm -hmm. but we're all of one race and that's the human race and that's the most important. So one, maybe one way, and I, I hate to add to your project, it's your project, but <laughs> if you did put a white man up there in a police off in a police uniform, you could get a whole right now in this society, what's going on, it could start so many conversations and maybe lead us somewhere because we're obviously struggling. Uh, it's, uh, it's good. Yeah, yeah, it's a good idea. I, I, I and at the t at the time that we I, that we put did that photograph, it, it it just wasn't putting the right light on the emphasis of what I was trying to do. But hearing in a different context and what you're saying, you know, my mind is spinning a bit, and I see what you're saying. And, if, and I only, I would only do it if it would help, and that's what I'm hoping this does. I, I'm just terrified that it could detract by putting a white male in a police uniform, because I don't want the police union to think that I'm trying to do something negative, which is not the case. But it's all about how it's presented. And, and what you're saying, it, 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 you know, it, it, it's, it, I get it, I hear it, and it makes a lot of sense, and I, you, you have something there. I just don't want it to be viewed negative, and I think it's just about presentation. You know? um, I would, would want to just also make us an additional comment. I think what's, fun, what's fascinating, back to my earlier point, is that there are two white males in the exhibit, right? But they're not placed where we would, we would I'd view them as white male. Four. I mean, we have- four. For, oh, excuse me, I didn't even, I wasn't okay. even counting, but there are white men in the exhibit. It's just that then you're focusing on other aspects of their identity mm -hmm. and then shifting the gaze because I have friends that also fall into the transgender category that are white men and they fully recognize that they are now white men and, and what, they, what does that mean when they walk on the street and now they're just, the gazes are different. Same for black trans women. Uh, yes, for black trans women and the black trans men. Like, the gazes look different. And so how to grapple with the shifts and changes of identity, I just think it's fascinating that we are like, there are no white men, but there are. Then the second part is that this is once again, um, for me, this exhibit was about power, and white men tend to be the representative category of power and privilege. And so I'm not 100% sure that I would want to see white men under the category of gender per se. It's just more how would you deal with power and white supremacy and just and sexism when you have basically a white male who, yes, we can, as you were saying, they don't stick. Why? Because many times white men and sometimes white women are not given the, are, are not given the same uh, essentialization. They're not treated the same way. If I am a black woman, suddenly I am representing all black women as I speak. Right. But a white man does not necessarily do that, is able to stand on their own two feet and express their own ideas, and it does not become endemic of the entire or representative of the entire group. Um, so I just that was just a comment. I'm sorry, but it was just an interesting point. Uh, two things that are going through my mind, and a third, which I'm not quite yet resolved to know exactly how to raise. Uh, the first is that I appreciate that in addition to regional differences in the words that you've given people, you also go back in time. So I see words that I haven't heard for 50 years. And that's... Uh, it's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, I think that's probably true. But, but it also gives depth to what you've done that I wouldn't have immediately seen if I just looked very briefly at the stereotype. Um, <clears throat> the second that I really appreciate is that you treat this as a work in progress and that you've allowed us to share some thoughts about it, um, whether that means you'll end up behind the <clears throat> camera again or not uh, and doing this with more subjects or not, I don't know. but. The fact that we're talking about that, I think, makes this an extraordinarily wonderful opportunity. So thank you. Thank you. Um, 
The third one I'm going to ponder a bit more <laughs> before I go on. Not a problem. Um, actually, Jarrell and I were talking about this right when we were first looking at just the first two photographs. Um, this is a United South End Settlements, a developmental organization um, across ages. And you just said something that really struck me, which was your ability to sort of process what happened to you a couple of years ago was probably quite different from the impact of something very similar, even more harsh when you were younger. Um, so I was just curious if you could talk a little bit from your, your own perspective and experience about what the weight of these words, how they affected you when you were younger as opposed to how contrast that with now. Because I think that's a big discussion we need to have about the world in general, like at the end of the day, when we're thinking about our kids, um, and these are all our kids, right? Is to really think about what is that impact? And even if you use that on an adult, like you're still using it in front of our own children. And, and it's just tremendous. They don't have the capacity to process it or the way they internalize it is different. So I just wanted to kind of hear, you know, from your perspective as to what drove you. I'm sure this is rooted in much further back than just, you know, a couple of years ago. So I just wanted to kind of hear that perspective. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it goes back to childhood. Um, uh, I was fortunate that uh, my parents were very big on being open-minded and um, treating everybody the same. And so in my family environment, we had, you know, someone in, that was representative of all these groups. And so uh, early on, my, my, my mom's closest friend was uh, interracial marriage. Um, you know, obviously, family's negative, Native American. And you know, like I said, in, uh, representative of all these different groups. Um, I went to Catholic school, not Catholic, but I was one of a couple of um, kids of color in the school. And I had to hear that N-word uh, at a Catholic school, mind you, daily. And you know, it, 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 it stays with you. You know, it doesn't leave. And so, um, and then going to high school and to college, and I thought that with education and doing the right things, and then part of that's still in my brain, and I've, I've, I've acknowledged that it's not right, and, and I'll get to that, is that if you did the right things as society said you should, you won't fall under one of these labels. And I'll never forget, I graduated college and had my degree in hand, and I think a week later I got as I used to always do, get pulled over. I got pulled over by the police and got questioned. And I remember asking why was I pulled over. And you know, after getting an airful uh, from the officer friendly there, um, it was. I, I realized that it, it, it didn't matter what successes I had, it, um, and I did what society said. I was still going to be classified as this whatever. And um, I thought it would lessen, and that was, I guess, my ignorance. Um, you know, I, st I stayed out of trouble, uh, got my degree, didn't have any children out of wedlock, as society says that us black males do. I, I, I did all the right things, and I just, when I had these, I had a couple instances um, in my early 20s over a couple of weeks and with the police, and I realized it just, it didn't matter what I did, I was still going to be looked at as this segment of society that is, is lesser. And then even getting into the, the working world, I still started to see, although it was more unconsciously done or subtle, but it's, it's just always, it's always been there. And I think I had had enough when I had those two, op those two instances at work and they weren't heavy handed like the elders were. They weren't, it wasn't like when I got pulled out of a car at one o'clock in the morning and frisked on the side of the road. It wasn't when I got pulled over at two in the afternoon and got threatened with a baseball bat by a cop in, in the back of a parking lot. Those were much more heavy handed. Those stayed with me, but it just over time, your frustration and tolerance builds and you just get to a point where you just, you can't take it anymore. And that's why this has been done. And like I said, these instances at work weren't heavy handed, but they were the breaking point for me.
I, I, I had options. I, you know, I did yell at the security officer for picking me out of a couple hundred people that were leaving at the, at the time. And um, I, I always tried to stay above the fray and not resort to the angry black man that people would, would say I would be or we are. But it just, I just got to that point where I just couldn't deal with it anymore. And I just felt I had to do something. I didn't know it would turn into this, but I started with my photograph and, you know, Nick guided me and said, go forth with it. But it's, you know, I think Karen had asked, you know, the responses that I'm getting on the questionnaires, you know, I, I, you know, I did all the stats around it and my photograph and the Native American are the two photographs that people say really stuck with them because they understand the struggle. And these, these respondents weren't people of color. These were white people, if you will. And uh, that, mean, that means a lot to me because that says that it, it, people get it. If we just get some change, that'll be another thing, but we'll see. So hopefully that answers the question. Uh, so, sorry. as a person looking for media, I mean, I'm sorry, looking for religion at the age of, uh, in my 20s, looking for a religion to turn to and you see all the violence and things that go on between religions. Is it like, if I go and believe in this religion, wouldn't I be signing myself up already to believe, to, uh, sorry. Would I be signing myself up to disagree with somebody else's beliefs? Uh, you know, no, I, I can't answer that for you personally, but I think um, I, I think you just have to be open-minded about other faiths. And I think with what I've seen with faith, faith was the one group I said earlier that was considered the people had the most bias. And, it, and interestingly enough, it wasn't just those two faiths. It wasn't just Jews or Muslims. People wrote that faith is divisive. And I think we kind of all know that already. Um, but I think you just have to be open-minded and respective of other faiths. I, I'm not Catholic. I'm, I was raised Protestant. I went to Catholic school. I consider myself more Buddhist than anything else. But I'm open-minded, and I treat all faiths the same. And I think if whatever faith or path you go down for the faith that you decide to, to be a part of, I think you, have to con you should adopt that mindset and be open-minded and be acceptance of others. Whereas I think other people in some faiths aren't acceptive of other faiths at all. And I think that's why I was getting the responses that I was getting with, with faith is divisive. You know, the, the, the people that are considered evangelists who, who were on this path for this type of Christianity, and you must do this and you must do that. It's just, I, I just, in my opinion, I just think it's wrong. I think you should be acceptance of others, whether you believe in it or not. Er, um, are, are there any other final questions? from the audience tonight. Anyone else? Well, please join me in thanking Kevin again for being here tonight. Thank you so much, Kevin. I know that this has sparked some wonderful dialogue within our organization. Um, we have a lot of people who come through our doors. We offer workforce readiness classes here, and our students have been um, taking in your, your work, and we've been discussing it, and it's, it's been just really wonderful. So thank you um, for presenting this to us tonight. Thank um, you. We would like to invite you to, after this dialogue, I think it's important if you have time to go back and reflect and, and look at the, the photography and um, take your time. We're not going to close up for another few minutes, so you're welcome to enjoy more and food and beverage uh, and connect with people who are here tonight. But thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you.